Watching your creations come to life is very satisfying. In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at how to animate things in Blender, covering some key concepts such as keyframes and motion curves. Let's open a new general layout and switch to the animation workspace. Now there's two windows showing the 3D viewport. The one on the left is looking through the active camera and all the overlays have been disabled. The panel on the bottom is called a dope sheet and it's where we can plot and edit keyframes of motion. Now there's something below the dope sheet and that's our timeline. It's another window, but it's reduced so we can only see the controls. I'm going to position this cube by grabbing it and moving it back along the X axis. And now we'll set a keyframe. I'll hit the I key to do this. We're currently on frame one in our timeline. Now you should see a dot appear on the dope sheet. This is our first keyframe. Let's advance along the timeline. I'm going to click and drag on this playhead and move it to the right until I get to frame 60. Now I'm going to grab the cube, restrain it to the x-axis, and move it along so it slides into view and then back out of view. I'll hit I again, and this sets a new keyframe. Blender's default frame count is between 1 and 250. You can see the start and end frames down here in the lower right on the timeline bar. I'm going to set the end to 80 so that we don't have to wait all 250 frames before the animation loops back and we watch our cube move. Now I'll hit spacebar and the cube will slide into view and back out again. And the animation will repeat until we hit spacebar to stop. You have now animated your very first object in 3D space. We've got to expand this dope sheet a little bit, so I'll grab the divider here and drag up. The dope sheet shows a summary on the left. If we unfurl the information under summary, you'll see the cube object. Notice how this kind of mirrors the outliner. If we reveal what's inside the cube, you'll see that there is an animation action. Let's unhide what's under this, and you should see a list of object transforms. Every property that we have keyframes for, location, rotation, and scale. Now, we only moved this cube along the x-axis, but because we used the hotkey I to insert a keyframe, it added a keyframe for all the transform properties. You will notice that most of these transform properties have this yellow bar across them. This indicates that no change has been made between these two keyframes for each of these properties. However, there's no bar between the X location keyframes. I'm going to enable auto keying by hitting the circle button on the playback window. It's kind of like the record button. And I'll move my playhead back to about frame 30. I'll now go into front view and I'll grab the cube, constrain its motion to the Z axis and move it up. A keyframe is automatically added to the Z location, but no other object transform. Now keyframes are one way that we can tell objects how to move in time, but there are other ways of viewing this information, such as motion curves. I'm going to change the 3D viewport window on the left here to a graph editor, and I'll swing my 3D viewport here on the right. Now by default, my graph editor has the side panel taking up most of the real estate, so I'll hit N to hide it and reveal my graphs. If I hover my mouse over the graph editor and hit the home key, all of our curves will fill this space. On the left, we'll see similar keyframe information as we noticed in our dope sheet. The cube, cube action, object transforms. But where there are keyframes on the dope sheet, we now see curves for each animated property. I want to focus on the Z location curve. I'll make all my object transforms invisible by hitting this I icon, and then I'll reveal just the Z location information. I'll hit home again, and the curve for this property should fill this window. Instead of playing the animation, I'm going to click and drag on my playhead, and you'll notice that as the playhead moves along, the cube 
goes up in the air and to the right, and then drops back down. See how the Z curve looks like that curve of motion? Now I'm going to do a little bit of a cheat here, but I'm sure you'll appreciate it, especially as a beginner. I'm going to select these two points, then hit the T key, and I can set a preset curve. I'm going to select Bounce. Now the curve transforms, and if we play the animation, the cube appears to fly up and then bounce when it hits the ground. Now there are keyframes we don't need here because there's no change in the cube's scale or rotation. So in the dope sheet, I'm going to box select all of these and delete them with X. Animation data is saved as a separate data block to object or editing data. Let's quickly take a look at the outline and reveal the data blocks for this cube. You can see that there's an animation data block as well as the mesh one. This means that we can edit the mesh data separately to the animation data. I'd like this cube to appear to be bouncing along the ground on its base and not from its center. So I'll go into edit mode, select all the vertices by hitting A and then move them up. I'll hit G to grab, Z to constrain it to the Z axis and control to snap it in increments. One unit up should be enough. The object origin hasn't moved so it should still be in line with our ground plane. I'm going to rotate my view a little bit so that in perspective mode, I can see that when I add a plane with Shift A, plane, and scale this up, we can have something that mimics some sort of ground. Now let's play through the animation. You can see that it's better already, if a little slow and smooth. Now we don't have to redo this animation to get it exactly as we want, because we've already got keyframes and curves. Let's begin by reducing the animation length. We can do this on the dope sheet. I'm going to set my playhead at frame one, select all the keyframes with A, and then hit S to scale. Then I'll move my mouse along to shrink the gaps between these, or I can even enter a finite number, 0.5 for example. If we take a look at the graph editor, you'll notice that the curves have adjusted to reflect this. And the bounce has also been scaled. I'm going to set my end frame to 40 so we don't have to wait all 80 frames before it loops around, and I'll hit spacebar to play. Okay, we can now see that the cube rises in the air and bounces a lot faster. I'm going to set my playhead to frame 16. It's where the cube's highest point is. The curve for the Z location is already in edit mode for us. I can select this point, hit G, and move this up or down. You should see that the cube will move along the Z axis in real time as we adjust this. I'm okay with it reaching its height about here, so I'll click to commit this change. So maybe we can do something about how this cube rises. Right now it's pretty smooth, and that's a bit unrealistic. So let's grab this handle on the first point here and move it to change the curve so it looks more like a parabola as we'd expect it. Now by default, the curve handles will move together as if they're connected, but we can set the curve type to different modes with the V key. We can break the tangent if needed and adjust each side of the curve independently. Now the arc of the cube looks much nicer. You can finesse the motion to your heart's content from here on in, because it's simply more of the same. You can add, adjust, edit curves until you get the kind of path that you feel comfortable with. You can even animate transforms out of order. For example, if we wanted to add a little scale to this cube, we don't need to do that along with the position. We can go to a keyframe, scale the cube, and because we're on auto key, it should set a key for that change. Then we go to another frame, change the scale, and so on. We can also box select or shift select keyframes or points on curves and move them about. Now when we play back this animation, it looks like we've added a little squash and stretch to our cube, giving it some personality. Besides transforms, of course, you can animate almost any property of an object imaginable. 
I'll first switch my viewport shading from solid to material because I want to see some material properties for this cube. I'll select our cube and open its material properties. Now you may have noticed that there's a small dot to the right of many of these variables here. Any property that has a dot here can be animated. We won't go too overboard, let's just affect the color of this cube. I'm going to move our playhead to just before the bounce. Then I'm gonna click on the color swatch and change its color to a yellow. I'll now click on this dot and it should change into a diamond. In our dope sheet, as well as our graph editor, we now have a property called material and a new keyframe. I'll advance the timeline to the first impact, then change my color to red. I'll go to where it bounces next and change it to green. Then for the final bounce, I want it to go back to its original color. So in my dope sheet, I'm going to select the first keyframe, hit Shift D to duplicate, I'm automatically in grab mode, and I can slide this over to where I need it. Okay, so now we have colors changing on each bounce, but it smoothly transitions between the bounces, and I don't want that. I want it to trigger a color change on each bounce. So this is a pretty easy fix. I'll right click on the first color keyframe, and from the drop down, I can change out interpolation mode to constant. Now I can do this for each of the keyframes, but instead I'm going to box select the next couple of keyframes and do the same. So this happens for both of them. Now when we play our animation, we get our cube switching colors on each bounce. This is looking great, and we've only animated one object here, but when we render this, the camera view is not going to capture the best angle. So why don't we give this camera a little bit of animation too? I'm going to select the camera, then I'll hit numpad zero to look through it. I'm going to open my side panel, hotkey N, and select the view tab. Then I'll lock my camera to view. We'll take our playhead to somewhere near the end of the animation. I'm gonna go with frame 36. And I'll position my camera view by zooming, panning, and rotating until I've got my camera view looking at the cube as I want it on the end of the animation. Because I've still got auto keying enabled, a keyframe is automatically added. Now let's wind back our time to frame one, and now I'll reposition my camera in our viewport. The auto key should set another keyframe. Finally, let's advance to where the cube is at its highest. I'll rotate our view so the camera follows this cube as it jumps up, and hopefully when we play this back, we'll see that the camera is watching the cube leap and bounce and come to rest. Now this may need to be finessed a little, but you now have the tools and knowledge to do this. So play around with the camera's curves, adjust its keyframes, or tweak its position and rotation slightly until you get the results that you're looking for. We'll finally set this lamp to illuminate the cube from the right angle. And if you're satisfied, let's do a render. Do you remember how? It's okay, I'm going to refresh your memory. Let's go to our output properties. We'll scroll down to output and set a folder for our sequence. When naming the file, you can allow Blender to number each frame by default, in which case it will add a four digit number to the end of your file name for each frame. Or you can be really specific. I'm gonna give this a name like jumping cube underscore double hashtag. The number of hashtags will limit the padding of each frame number. Because I've got two hashtags, this is going to make it two digits. Now we can hit Control F12 and we'll render out our very first sequence. You'll see the image editor pop up and you'll see each frame rendered one frame at a time. 
Now that's just a quick introduction, and of course there is so much more to cover when it comes to animation. We do have some core fundamentals courses on that, and pretty much anything that Wayne Dixon has done here at CG Cookie is worth checking out. Now we've only got a couple more lessons of the Blender Basics here, so when you're comfortable, let's get on to the next one.